So um, thanks. My name is Frank Falco, and I'm going to walk through some data characterization tools that help you evaluate um, results of your ETLs. Uh, I'm a senior director in the Observational Health Data Analytics Group at Johnson & Johnson. So to start off, data standardization is the process by which we're converting our native data sources to the OMOP common data model. And the OMOP common data model is a system of tables, vocabularies, and conventions that allow us uh, to take observational health data and convert it to a standardized form. And I think one of the keys that I'd like to um, emphasize here is often groups undertake uh, the, the work necessary to convert their data to the OMOP common data model, and then don't necessarily take advantage of some of the benefits of that, which are um, being able to leverage these tools to both evaluate your ETLs and uh, the data that you've converted, but also characterize and um, actually evaluate the data quality of those data sources. So converting and uh, performing the data standardization is your first step, uh, but then we want to make sure that you have the opportunity to benefit from the tools uh, that build off of this standardized stack. And the first in that uh, standardized stack is a tool called Achilles, which provides database level characterization. So Achilles and Achilles goes way back. So I had to find the actual acronym for it, but it stands for Automated Characterization of Health Information at Large Scale Longitudinal Evidence Systems. So it actually does have a meaning. Achilles is an open source R package that uh, has been built by the Odyssey community, and it provides uh, over 250 descriptive uh, analyses uh, that run on top of an OMOP CDM. And these uh, analyses are at the database level. So um, for those who are more familiar with some of the tools that work on individual cohorts, so after we uh, develop a phenotype, for example, we'll characterize that phenotype. Um, here, what we're saying is for the entire population of the database and all the elements in the database, let's perform characterizations um, that both help us to understand the content and also assess some of the characteristics of that data set. So those uh, analyses include things like um, summaries of uh, drug uh, exposures, condition occurrence, various demographics across all of the different platforms. And uh, being the open source community that we are, you can find uh, Achilles at the GitHub um, Odyssey repo in the Achilles repository. Uh, last year um, was our latest release in May of 2023 with version 1.7.2. Um, this was a uh, significant update as we conformed and met the standards of the ongoing Hades guidelines and were able to actually publish uh, Achilles to CRAN, um, making it uh, more available for members within the community. In terms of ongoing work on uh, Achilles, we're um, working to address various performance issues across platforms. As uh, most people are familiar, uh, the, the community has their data in a variety of relational database management systems. And so as we identify performance issues in one, we try and provide um, the standardized analyses in ways that work best across all the platforms while not necessarily being specialized to any one of them. So it's a significant challenge and we're continuing to work uh, to address those issues. We're adding new characterizations as the CDM evolves. So as the CDM goes from um, version to version, we try and make sure that the uh, Achilles analyses evolve as well so that we're continuing to stay on pace with what the, the standard evolves to. Um, in, the, in the longer term, we're planning a 2.0 release. Um, with some refactored uh, performance logging, where we've seen some um, issues uh, recently, as well as incremental modes so that um, your Achilles runs when they, they take a long time and they fail, we want to make sure that things are a little bit more fault tolerant and you don't necessarily have to restart and rerun um, pieces of uh, Achilles that you've already completed.
So that's one of the two tools that I'll be covering today. Uh, the second is ARIES, and so ARIES stands for a research exploration system, and the intent of ARIES is to provide a interface to reviewing the content of all of the analyses um, that uh, both Achilles and the data quality dashboard, which you'll hear more about, um, actually generate as part of the evaluation of a uh, common data model that has been standardized. So ARIES as a tool, as I mentioned, provides an interface, but in terms of the architecture, I wanted to highlight that ARIES is actually two pieces. One is ARIES indexer. This is an R package that summarizes and indexes the results from Achilles and DQD, so they can be presented in the ARIES interface. And the other is the ARIES um, web application itself, which provides that um, web interface. For some who've been around the community a while, you may be familiar with what used to be called Achilles Web. Achilles Web was an interface that was written over a decade ago that provided an interface to just um, the Achilles results. Ares is providing uh, an upgrade to that experience so that you have an uh, integrated uh, platform where you can review both the Achilles results and the data quality dashboard results. Additionally, whereas the Achilles web platform only was able to show you um, results from the latest version of any um, conversion of your data into the CDM, Ares actually gives you the ability to track um, multiple versions or releases, as we call them, of any data source over time. Uh, and in terms of um, evaluating your ETL, this is very helpful because you're able to see how your data set actually changes from one release to the next. So uh, let's jump over and I'll do a quick demo of Aries. Um, probably the most important, uh, given that this uh, the, the white tends to burn my eyes, um, is uh, Aries does have a dark mode, so you can uh, switch into that from the settings menu. Ares views the world in terms of three layers. The first is the overall data network. The second is the data source, and the third is a data source release. So if I start at this overall data network level, you'll see here at the top that we have a category of reports for network, source, and release. And then the report menu will give you the options of what you can view, for uh, each of those three levels. So I'm going to start here by just reviewing this network overview. You could see that it will provide you a listing of the number of data sources, how many overall people are categorized, data quality issues that have been identified, and the number of releases. So here you'll see uh, in our environment, we have over 221 individual releases of 27 data sources. That's in, in aggregate. Um, as well as the, the data quality issues that have been identified. A table gives you the base information you might expect, seeing where the um, data source has observation time when it begins, when it ends, the latest release, what vocabulary version was used, the data quality issues, how many releases there have been, and how often the data set is updated. So all of this high-level information just for your your internal network. If you have one data source, it'll show your one. If you have multiple, it'll show multiple. Um, a few other reports that I think are helpful to look at at this uh, overall network level. Um, one is called the data strand report. What the data strand report shows you is the proportion of each data source that are represented by the different domains within the um, the common data model. So for example, here we could see uh, this reddish color um, represents measurements, and you could see that some data sources have high proportions of the overall data in the data set that is um, measurement content, whereas other data sources will have, say, observation as the predominant uh, domain where the data is being represented. So this information gives you a way to, um, at a very high level, uh, review the content and compare across your overall network. 
Um, one of the newer reports that was added, I will also just go through is uh, the network diversity report. So uh, this allows you to view the ethnicity and um, race stratifications across all of your data sources. So you could see what diverse populations are represented within your networks and which data sources contain um, those populations. So this at the um, the data network level. Next, I'm going to jump over to the data source level. So if I switch to data source and then choose a particular data source from my environment, you could see that there have been 16 releases um, roughly once per quarter. Um, there are um, lists um, or graphs here, I should say, that give you information around the population history. Now, um, this specifically is telling you with each release of the data source how that uh, release has changed in terms of the overall population of the data set. So this gives you um, a good understanding of whether or not the data source is growing over time, which most of the time we expect. It gives you an opportunity to evaluate whether or not there's some drop off and then potentially data quality issues that are occurring. Uh, the data within um, each of these uh, views are available as um, both a, a table or a graph. Um, there are also uh, uh, capabilities within the system to add notes and annotations to any graph across areas. Um, here you could see this release listing down towards the bottom, and that gives us the opportunity to jump into the last level of areas, which is the data source release. Um, and here uh, what we're viewing is for a particular data source, um, a release. You could see here that you could choose from all of the releases that have ever been published to our environment to review how that data source existed in that point in time. And then um, the various reports that are available. There are over a dozen reports available currently at this data source release level. Here we're looking at the person report, which gives you a high level view of the number of people, the proportion by sex, the population stratification by age and sex, age at first observation, population by race, population by year of birth, ethnicity, and so on. So a high level demographics view of the data source. Um, here, uh, as I described, are the other um, reports that you can view. Uh, there are many. You could see the complete data quality results of a data source. Um, I'm going to drop into, I guess, let's uh, start with the conditions report. Here you could see the condition occurrence um, uh, data from within this uh, particular data source. To be clear, what we're looking at here is the proportion of people that have at least one um, code for acute respiratory infection in the data source. So you could see 17% um, of people have a uh, condition occurrence, at least one record. You could also see the records per person in average for that particular condition. You could search the table to look up particular concept IDs or concepts uh, that you are interested in. There are uh, other columns that give you the pure numbers and deltas so you could compare to prior versions of the data source. Clicking on any one of the individual conditions in this table gives you a, a complete breakdown of the particular condition. So you can see here we have the concept ID, the number of people, the percent of people, the records per person, age at first diagnosis for acute respiratory infection, conditions by type tells you a little bit about the provenance of the data, whether it's coming from claims, inpatient, outpatient, or derived through some pharmacy. You could see record count proportions over time per month. Here we see a relatively seasonal pattern for uh, respiratory infections. And then finally, stratifications by um, age, sex, and year across uh, these different age deciles. If I drop into the uh, uh, drug exposures report, you'll see that we have the same type of um, listing, the same capabilities uh, exist for each of these uh, drug exposure concepts. So you could go and see age at first exposure, the type of drugs, 
Um, you'll also see that there is some context specific reporting that occurs. For example, here um, with the drug exposure, we could see days supply and quantity, things that you wouldn't necessarily want to characterize for a condition occurrence. And uh, this is the case across each of the domains where there will be context specific um, reports and graphs, depending on which domain you're looking at within the platform. In terms of ongoing development, um, what you'll see uh, in the, well, what I just demonstrated is actually in the develop branch of the uh, ARIES platform. So it represents a, a substantial UI refactor that's been completed, as well as support for DuckDB um, based on some issues that sites were seeing with um, what we call a small file problem, which I could describe offline if anybody really wants to have that conversation. It's lots of fun. Um, we're adding additional reporting, and there are capabilities um, for the ARIES platform to integrate with the um, web API. And of course, um, what presentation would be complete without a request to join the journey? So if you are a, a developer or uh, an ETL or, or um, merely anyone in the Odyssey community who'd like to contribute, or to be involved, um, you can view the repositories on GitHub for both Ares uh, and Achilles. Feel free to join the conversation uh, on those platforms. Great, thank you, Frank. Uh, I mentioned in the chat, we should have time, I believe, at the end of Efra Katie's uh, presentation. I don't wanna do it right now. I wanna make sure everyone has uh, maximum time but we should have time uh, for questions for any of the tools being discussed. Uh, so you can put them in the chat, but, but we can do some Q&A as well. On that note, I'm gonna turn it over to Katie for a, uh, for a presentation on the data quality dashboard. Yes, great. Can you all see my slides? Yes, I can. Wonderful. Uh, okay, so my name is Katie Sadowski and I'm on the real world evidence team at Boehringer Ingelheim. I'm also the maintainer of the data quality dashboard tool. Uh, which I will be introducing to you all today. Uh, so to set the scene, what is data quality? Um, in Odyssey, we define data quality as the state of completeness, validity, consistency, timeliness, and accuracy that makes data appropriate for a specific use. So for any given data use case, there's a level of each of these parameters that will allow us to consider a data set to be of sufficient quality to help us accomplish our goal, whatever that is. And so when we measure data quality, we're essentially measuring the fidelity of a data set to the true patient experience, the full story of everything that happened in each patient's healthcare journey. And this fidelity can be compromised in two major ways. The first is when the data is originally recorded in whatever source system we're getting our data from. So patient information is being entered or streamed into an EHR, a claims being filed for a procedure, a case report form is filled out. There's a big gap between everything that actually happened to the patient and what ends up in these systems. And the second major source of data quality issues arises when that data is extracted from the source system for secondary use. Um, so ultimately, in the case of Odyssey, this data is ending up in our OMOP CDM. Uh, the second arrow here actually represents a lot of different transformations. So in the case of an EHR, for example, the data is going into like the EHR backend database. Then it's being exported into some sort of raw export format. Then it's being transferred to a centralized warehouse where it's cleaned and processed in various ways. Maybe it's de-identified. Then it's being sent to users or customers who finally are doing their OMOP ETL and generating an OMOP CDM. So you can see this data is moving through a lot of a lot of different transformations. A lot could go wrong. When a lot of people think about data quality, though, I think they're really talking about this uh, first type of data quality. EHR data is a mess. It's full of data entry errors. Our institution's EHR is missing the full picture for each patient since we only have interactions with our healthcare system. Claims data is missing lab results. Claims are full of upcoding and false diagnoses. Um, so I could go on and on. These are all valid data quality issues, but it's only one piece of the picture. Um, and it's important we don't forget all of the things that can and do go wrong after the data leave their original home. This is especially true in Odyssey, where we're all performing the super complicated ETL into OMOP, which is the topic of our presentations today. 
Um, so the whole premise of Odyssey is we're all using the same data model and we can assume certain things about how to interact with the CDM. But if our ETL is done incorrectly, those assumptions are going to fail. So not only are we corrupting our data's fidelity to this true patient experience, we're also leading analysts astray who are expecting the data to comply with the OMOP spec. So in my opinion, we can't even think about that first type of data quality until we know we haven't caused any problems by messing with the data in our ETL. Um, the improved documentation we're developing this month in the Olympians Collabathon, I think is going to be hugely helpful in providing better guidance for ETL developers to make sure they're all approaching certain decisions in the same way. But it's also good to have some objective checks on the database itself to make sure that the output of the ETL, one, meets our expectations given what we know about the source data, and two, meets the expectations of our users who are expecting an OMOP CDM that complies with the spec. And thankfully, Odyssey provides a tool to do just that. That's the data quality dashboard. So the DQD is an R package that's designed to perch right on top of an OMOP CDM and run analyses on all those aspects of data quality I mentioned before, completeness, validity, consistency, et cetera. And it surfaces the results in a nice browser interface that lets you hone in on potential issues in your CDM. So we've got kind of a summary view here, and then a report that shows the results of a bunch of data quality checks that are run by the tool. And people use the DQD in two main ways. The first is ETL developers running the DQD as part of the process of developing and maintaining an OMOP ETL. They'll write a bunch of mapping code, run their pipeline, and then they'll run DQD to catch any mistakes that they might have made. Ah, the visit table's empty. There's duplicated patients in the person table. None of my measurements mapped. DQD is going to catch all of these sorts of things and help you drill down into what might have gone wrong. The other main user profile is a data analyst or researcher who's using an OMOP CDM and wants to understand what data quality issues might exist in that database. Now let's hope the ETL developer of that CDM also used DQD and already fixed the really critical issues caused by their bugs. But there are other types of issues that can't be addressed in the ETL. For example, 50% of conditions are missing a status. Well, the ETL developer confirmed that's expected because in all of those cases, maybe the conditions came from a field in the EHR that has no status associated with it. This is still imp important information for a data user who might have been planning to filter on condition status in their analysis. Seeing this data quality metric, they might change their mind about how to approach that. So the building block of DQD's analyses is called a data quality check. And we define a data quality check as an aggregated summary statistic that can be computed against a data set and to which a decision threshold can be applied to determine if the statistic meets expectations. Bit of a mouthful, uh, but I have some examples to clarify that a bit. Shout out to Claire and Andrew. I got these visuals from your symposium presentation from back in 2019, so they're still going strong. Um, so this check is one of our plausible value checks the number and percent of records with the value in the day's supply field of the drug, drug exposure table less than zero. So here we're thinking there's probably something wrong if you've got a negative day's supply for your drug. And DQD actually has a bunch of checks just like this one on numeric value fields. Essentially, this check type is implemented as a parameterized SQL query into which we pass every possible combination of tables, fields, and numeric value fields where it's relevant. And so here's another example. This is the number and percent of records which are not mapped into a standard concept in the condition concept ID field of the condition occurrence table. Here we're looking for conditions that we failed to map to a standard OMOP concept. And again, this check is genericized in DQD to run on every stand up standard concept field in every table. So the DQD, I think, has 28 different check types now that all use the same format and is checking a huge variety of things from basic database conformance all the way to things like plausible combinations of genders and procedures and measurements and units. And then the final element here is the threshold. So if we go back to our definition of a data quality check, recall that this includes a decision threshold that's used to decide whether or not the check result is expected. And if not, to fail the check and alert the user that something needs to be done about it. So each check result might range from zero, no records violated the check, to 100. Every single record violated the check. And the threshold is the value of that result above which we think it's worth doing something about the issue. 
How do we figure out what that threshold should be? Well, sometimes it's easy and sometimes it's not. We've got what we call fatal checks. For these ones, the threshold is always zero. We can't allow any records to violate that check. These are things like a CDM table not existing in a database, a required column having null values, an integer column containing strings. These are critical violations of the OMOP spec that could cause someone's analysis to throw an error. Um, then we have checks on CDM conventions, which in theory should have no violating records, but in practice might need their threshold adjusted. An example of this would be the standard concept checks. So ideally we can map every single source code to a standard OMOP concept, but in reality, sometimes a standard concept just doesn't exist for a given code. So depending on what's in your data, you might need to allow some level of failure there. As you can tell from this example, running GPD is going to be an iterative process. We start off probably with more strict thresholds and then adjust as needed once you dig into the data. And then finally, we have what we call characterization checks. So these ones, basically the threshold always needs to be customized to your source data. For example, if you don't have any specimens in your source, set specimen completeness threshold to 100 or even turn off those checks altogether. Maybe we expect every single death record in a certain database to have a cause of death. In this case, we'd be setting our death source value completeness to zero. So those two scenarios are pretty simplistic, but you can imagine that figuring out the right threshold for a lot of metrics might actually depend on what you're planning to do with your data. This gets really complicated, and it's honestly outside the current scope of the DQD tool, but I think it's worth mentioning because really you should be thinking about this sort of thing when you get a DQD report. Um, so for example, Say we have a check on missing drug quantity. In some studies, you might not care about this at all. Maybe you're not even looking at drug data. But what if you need to identify patients receiving at or above a certain daily dose for which you need the quantity to calculate that dose? What percent of drug records are you okay with having a missing quantity? Above what rate of missingness might your analysis results be impacted? So you know, think for a moment about all the different inputs that would go into answering this question. Depending on the study, it might get really complicated. So like I just said, DQD can't answer this question for you, but I think it can at least point you in the right direction by flagging potential issues that might impact your analysis. And for now, it's just up to the user to dive in to the data and make that fitness for use determination. Time check, okay, I've got a few minutes left, perfect. Um, so that was the kind of overview of what we're doing with DQD. And now here's the really high level steps you can take to get started. Uh, so three requisites, you need an OMOP CDM, and you need an R environment that's set up following the Hades instructions, which are linked on the slide. And I can also throw in the chat after the presentation. So then once you're set up with your environment, you're gonna install and execute the DQD following instructions that we have on our documentation website. Um, so by default, DQD is gonna apply preset, preset data quality check thresholds, um, which may or may not be relevant for your CDM like we discussed before. The recommendation usually is to just give it a run with the default thresholds, and then you can iterate and configure those thresholds on your own. And we've got a specific documentation page describing how to do this. And then finally, I just wanted to mention what we've got cooking on the DQD development team. First, we are in the process of adding new documentation for every single check type that gives really detailed guidance on how to interpret check failures and what to do if a check fails. Um, and in here, you can see on this little GIF, we're providing guidance for both ETL developers and for data users. So this is something new, and we hope it's gonna be really helpful for folks who might not know what to do when they receive that DQD report. Um, these are also on our DQD website, which I will link in the chat afterwards. Um, we've also been adding and updating data quality checks, and we are working on adding a parameter in the code for those severity levels I mentioned before, so fatal convention and characterization. And most excitingly, we're working on a new user interface for the DQD report. Uh, so stay tuned for all of that, hopefully within this year. Last but not least, thanks to our contributors in 2024. I really, really appreciate everyone's help uh, building out this package. And like Frank said as well, everyone is welcome to join the journey. This is an open source tool and we welcome contributions from anyone in Odyssey. So thanks so much. Excellent. Thank you, Katie, uh, Katie and Frank for these presentations. OK, we have uh, 10 minutes left. We specifically uh, made sure we had time for Q&A. So uh, any questions about any of the three tools or, you know, certainly if you have questions for 
uh, Claire and Melanie, uh, we can ask them here too. Uh, I know there were a couple in the chat. I feel like they may have been answered, but if you had a question in the chat, you want to just kind of address it again. Um, you know, please just raise your hand on mute, uh, and we will we can take them then. It's also possible that things were explained so clearly and so well that there are no questions. Uh, here we go. Hayden, uh, Hayden, go ahead. Hey, so I've been working on um, transformation of OMOP into various different data model representations. Um, right now, uh, graph is kind of the target. I'm wondering if, if either of you have seen efforts like that before or um, specifically with ETL, how that might go. Um, I've I've seen a few things on the forums of people who have tried it before, um, but I, I don't really want to reinvent anything here. If, uh, if for example, um, Frank, you've seen kind of a, a efforts before, even in just a different format from relational data storage uh, to to a different kind of style. Possibly you've stumped the people. Anybody have any thoughts? Well, I'll, I'll just I'll just chime in on that, uh, Hayden. One of the things that I, I noticed uh, I've seen now several times, and it's not going to be specifically to graph, but just when people are really interested in thinking about transforming their data and putting it into some sort of non-supported data structure, is that they're they're thinking, what's the big deal? It's just yet another data structure that we can put the database in, but that's not in full recognition of that we don't, as a community, we don't and shouldn't think about the data model as the endpoint, but we need to think about the broader ecosystem of the the data model in conjunction with the tools to enable generating evidence. And so oftentimes when we're in this situation where people are thinking about, hey, I'd really like to put my data in some sort of format that isn't supported, it isn't just the data model work group. It's not it's not Claire's fault that we don't provide a million different flavors of of DDLs for different data structures, but it's actually the broader community decision about how to try to identify sets of platforms that we are trying to support to accommodate everybody to be able to take advantage of the full stack. That's not to say that you can't have a database in some sort of other format, but it is to say that if you make that choice, then you're kind of going about it your own in terms of taking advantage of your standardized data to be able to participate in network studies or uh, execute any of the great tools that Katie and Frank are showing or or expanding further even into the Hades packages or or next week you'll hear about all of the great stuff that's happening like in the Darwin EU community and all of that stuff's kind of predicated on some basic core stack. And so it's not to say that you can't go in a different direction, but it is to say that there's kind of a Pur purposeful reason why there's the the environments we support and why we can't um, extend that without substantial uh, effort as a broader community and that it's not just a, a, a data model issue. Yeah, let, let me let me briefly rephrase something because I think specifically Katie might be able to answer this for me. Uh, sure. Do we have any um, I guess performance measurements? Less data data quality, but more of uh, actually. Does the data quality dashboard have anything in its uh, repository that's related to the actual performance of uh, the, the data procedures or or the analyses and in, in more of the computation, less of the the, the statistics? Uh, you mean like how long queries take to run? Yeah, or their um, their plans for such things. Mm. They don't. I don't. Oh, go ahead, Frank. Yeah, they they don't have plans, but both Achilles and DQ do do capture the 
query durations for all of the queries that are run. And then we do use those to try and prioritize optimizations or work around uh, improving the performance of those queries against different platforms. And they do vary. Uh, and as we've seen people migrate to, to Spark-based environments, we've seen some queries that fall over. Um, some of the challenges there, and this is something that we're trying to address with the Technical Advisory Board is, you know, if we don't have a Spark and or Databricks and or Snowflake environment available within the Odyssey community, um, how do you verify that performance improvements do in fact maintain consistent results across platforms? Um, but otherwise, in short, yes, those those types of uh, performance characterizations are captured by both of those platforms. Okay, that's that, yeah, it's really helpful. I'll, I'll just also add that the um, uh, in the e Eden project, Maxime created uh, Maxime and Peter created the CDM onboarding package, which was specifically a set of benchmarks to evaluate as databases were coming on, and those were specifically about computational performance to understand environments. So that's also a really good resource to take a look at. Yeah, uh, Katie, you had. Yes, I have a question yeah. for Frank. So I was running Achilles recently and ended up having to dig into the SQL output, like all the different SQL queries it runs. And I noticed there were some queries in there which don't seem to, the results of which don't seem to be in the Atlas data sources report. There was things like number of patients with at least one measurement and at least one diagnosis or something like that. That seemed almost data quality-esque. Does Aries surface those? And if not, how could we actually get a report for them? Because some of them seem pretty useful. Yeah, so specifically for that query that you mentioned, um, number of people with with a record in a domain, that is used by the data source feasibility report within Aries. Um, so that tool allows you to do um, something similar to the other uh, data feasibility approaches to determine whether or not there, uh, a study is feasible, but um, it does it at a much uh, higher level um, and can't get as uh, specific or thorough as the work that Claire has done on the database profiler and, and feasibility packages. But those analyses are used um, within there. Uh, they could be exposed in, in other places, but for now that is the the primary reason. Um, actually, I'll, I'll mention within Achilles, there are a lot of analyses that are turned off by default. So there's a lot buried in there. For example, there's a ton of like cost analyses that are turned off by default. There's some co-occurrence analyses that are turned off and those are turned off for two reasons. One, we've seen performance challenges across various sites and platforms with some of those. Um, and then also there is less utilization of them. So it's one of those situations where if you specifically want to make use of those analyses, you could go turn them on and, and take advantage of it, but otherwise we found that by default they're better uh, left off because it kind of fits the predominant use cases. Thanks. Uh, Jamie. Um, this is a question for Frank about Achilles and Ares. Are there any plans to include location-based analyses and location-based reports for data sources that include this information for users that to whom that is relevant yeah in fact there there is a thread somewhere i forget if it's in one of the the uh, github issues around adding gis reporting into aries um, for um, for characterization at that level it's it's not there today. It is one of the planned pieces. Um, it has been a lower priority as uh, for for some of these data sources, the amount of location data that's available is either um, limited or obscured in ways that make it difficult. Also, I think it's something that um, there needs to be some coordination with the GIS working group so that um, we're we're adhering to some of the work that I know they've been doing over the over the past years to ensure that we're kind of adhering to the way we should be doing those characterizations, but it's not there today. Let's schedule something so we can have have you co help coordinate that with us and we'll, we'll, we'll develop great. some objectives around that. That's great. Thank you. Uh, no, I, I asked because I had some, some 
um, discussions with people in the process of ETLing their data to whom location information is very important. And as, as you know, Frank, the data that we use does not have a great deal of location based granularity, but that's, you know, that's not everybody. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Okay, right, we had a couple other hands up and then they just went down. I know we're at the top of the hour. I don't know if Frank and Katie had a couple of extra minutes they could stay, um, but Paul, I know you had a question. Um, um, I think you. Oh. I, uh, I think Christian might have too. Yeah, Paul and Christian. So, but I need to run. I need to run, guys. Very good. All right, Paul. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um. Yeah. So very quickly about um the, the graph um question. So Hayden, I believe, asked about graphs and their efficiency. I've been working with Neo4j. Uh, I, I work for Kaiser. I've been working with Neo4j. Obviously, they're trying to get more customers, but um. I kind of ran into an issue where uh, any, almost every machine learning approach, um, it's really difficult to deduce what the heck is going on in the background. So like the logical or even conceptual mapping of what the queries are uh, specifically, like maybe I'm, I'm using Atlas and some of the descriptive analysis in the background is turned off for the data quality stuff. Um, but if I turn that on, I can maybe um, start to infer what the purpose of this data quality rules are versus just using graph machine learning outputs. It's, it's, I'm, I'm going to get nothing from that. The explainability component just completely disappears. I'm asking if uh, the, the Atlas uh, tool or perhaps the GitHub repos uh, for Aries and Achilles are the best places to find logical and conceptual like um, documentation for uh, the data quality uh, processes that go on? So I don't know if it's exactly what you're looking for, Paul. Um, and I I just had this page up on the CDM website, and as I was doing some work for April Olympians, it, it disappeared, so I need to put it back. Um, but last year, we worked on going across all of the major software um, you know, all the major softwares in Odyssey and identifying which tables and fields are actually utilized by each software. So which ones are used by the uh, cohort building engine Circe, which ones are used by feature extraction and so on and so forth to, uh, to kind of expose those um, most important, you know, columns in the CDM, depending on which software packages you want to use. Now, it doesn't necessarily get into the conceptual logic you're talking about, but it at least gives you an idea of which pieces are being used in what packages. Would that be helpful? Yeah, absolutely. Even okay. having the logical, like, <laughs> what to look for instead of having the actual code is, is, is a lot. So okay, yeah, so I, um, I'll put it back and I'll send you a link to that because I had it and then it disappeared today. Um, so I'll put it back and, and send it. I'll, uh, I'll reach out to you, Paul, um, and and I, I looked through some of this stuff for data quality at dashboard with the con framework, things like that. There's some overarching conceptual stuff, but I, I think we're we're probably working on some some similar stuff for I'm, I'm guessing similar reasons um, in terms of the, the analytics. Um, yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.